All right, welcome to Viola Swings Live. Thank you for coming out. We have a really cool event planned today. Myself and two other poets, we're going to do a round robin of reading poetry and then unlike other readings, we're gonna talk about each other's poems one by one. So you're gonna to get to hear one poem and really focus on it. And then, uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll talk about them. So we'll do a quick round of introductions, you know who we are. My name is uh, James Moorhead. I'm the founder of Beulah Swings and the Poet Laureate of Dublin, California. I've written two books, Canvas and Portraits of Red and Gray, and I'll be reading a couple of selections from it as part of this. I also uh, host the Beulah Swings Poetry Podcast, and both of these wonderful poets have been featured uh, on the podcast. Um, and so definitely go check that out. So let's go over to Jessica. Why don't you go next? Thanks, James. Uh, my name is Jessica Sabo. I'm a poet and former classical ballerina. And uh, my work focuses on the intersection between eating disorders, trauma, and sexuality. Um, I am the author of a chapbook published by Dancing Girl Press and Studio called A Body of Impulse. And I'll be reading a couple poems from that. Um, my work has also appeared in publications by Cathexis Northwest Press, Euless Wings Press, and 805 Lettenard. I'm really excited to be here and appreciate the opportunity. Great, Rachel. Fantastic. This is wonderful, James. I'm so happy to be doing this and to meet Jessica in this context. Um, so I'm Rachel. I am a recovering academic, I'm now the founder of a new community driven dating app. And um, I have also, this is my first book, The Birthday of the Dead. You can see it in the blur. Um, and I have two chat books, one published, one coming out, uh, I hope this year. And um, I'm just very excited to start reading for you. This is great. Terrific. Well, super excited to have both of you here and, and to be the guinea pigs for this uh, this format, which I think is a, is, is a little bit unique. So like I said, we're each going to read a poem and then the other two poets are going to interview the uh, the poet who has um, has read the poem and asked them questions. And we have not scripted any of this. So this is uh, going to be an organic, natural conversation. So I'm going to go first. And I'm going to start with a poem from my book, Canvas. This is my debut book. The cover art is by the incredible Carrie Byron. You may know her from Mythbusters. And uh, that's the original up on my wall. Uh, she does this incredible uh, black powder art. She also creates really cool sculptures. And this poem was inspired in part by uh, one of her sculptures. Carved. One. The sculptor prepares her tools, a discarded dentist probe for subtle detail, a twisted rake and wire brush to drape skin. Stepping back, she searches inside the polymer clay block for figures hidden, awaiting release. She starts by sculpting with her fingers, digging, smoothing, molding the clay until features emerge. One tool, then another, shaping, carving, blending, occasionally placing slabs of clay to form curled hair or adding a flowing skirt. The sculptor's world collapses inward, city cacophony muted, just fingers, tools, clay, working until in time there is nothing left to carve. Two. The poet prepares his tools, a blank page for letters, syllables, words, phrases, a puzzle to untangle, finding order and place. Stepping back, he stares at the empty page, searching memories for images to transform into well-ordered lines. He starts with random words, pleasing sounds, rhymes, and throwaway couplets to be worked and reworked. Words become phrases, become stanzas, whispered aloud to test their resonance, set aside to revisit later, discarded when impossible to mold. The poet searches for perfection, pacing the floor perplexed until, with a final pen stroke, the poem appears. Three, the sculptor's work set on a shelf, the poet's page slipped in a book, Visions carved in clay and words, buried deep, unseen, unheard. Carved. Thanks, 
So may we yes, ask you questions? Ask questions. Yes, you get to quiz me on anything you'd like about the poem, how it was written, anything you like. Yeah. Terrific. Okay, because so as so this poem sets up sculpture as a removal of all excess and and the what's not the sculpture, right? I mean, I think um, Michelangelo said that that you're, he's you know releasing the shape from the block of granite or marble mm -hmm. or whatever it is, and then the poet is accumulating uh, material into the poem. Do you where do you place yourself? I know that you are a poet, obviously, so it would you I would assume that it would be an an accumulate you know uh, accumulating object, but do you actually also sometimes feel like a sculptor? You know, I thought that as I, uh, first of all, I was um, inspired by the, 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 the sculpture that, uh, which is actually included, here, I'll hold it up here. It's really macabre, cool sculpture. And then I was just in, intrigued by the process of sculpting. And so I watched a bunch of YouTube videos on how sculptors work and the techniques. And I was really fascinated by it. And then I thought, um, how that, that, that there were parallels with poetry. Now it's sort of the inverse, you know, poetry is about displacing the silence on the page. Uh, Billy Collins, who I saw recently talked about how there's a blank page and the poem is displacing that, that silence, that white space, but to just the extent necessary. And a, and a, you know, a sculptor is discovering the thing that's already there and they're just taking away the, the clay or the, the stone that, that isn't necessary. But I thought there was some real parallels. So that's where I had fun with this poem is trying to find those parallels between the two and make the, both the one and two sections have exactly the same number of lines, not quite the same number of syllables, but as much as possible to be completely symmetrical. Marvelous. Yeah, I love this poem, James. And um, I wanted to ask you, so it's in three different sections. Um, and I love how it, it kind of shows the process of sculpting. But I wanted to know more about what your process was in, in writing this poem. Yeah, like a lot of my poems, they they start with just getting down images. So I just love this piece of art. I love doing acrostic uh, poems, and it kind of started as that. But then you have to; it has to be more than just a, a cool description. And uh, so I, you know, usually I don't know what the heck the poem's about, and I just start writing images. And then I had then this parallel was the epiphany. I'm like, ooh, okay, that's what this poem is about. The third short section was brutal. I rewrote that about. I don't know, a hundred times. I just, to try to wrap it up without too tightly wrapping it up. And I thought of, well, so many pieces of art and poetry are never seen. So they're put in a shelf, they're tucked away, they're created, but rarely seen. And so I thought, okay, that's that maybe that's a way to, to finish it. But I really had fun with the first two. So everything I learned about, I knew a lot about poetry. I know nothing about sculpture other than what I've watched. So I did a lot of research, the words, the techniques, and then tried to find these parallels. And that was a really fun, challenge to work on. Cool. All right. We are now going to round robin to Jessica. You are next to share your first poem. Sounds great. Thanks. Um, so my first poem is entitled Origin um, from my chapbook. In layers of tulle and ribbon, I treasured with every bone. Was a frosting capped finger wrapped around a sunlit braid, a wet mouth packed with sugar, free of guilt, all bouncing curl and pointed toes, rocking towards the moon on a back porch swing while clinging to its chains with hands still smooth from bath water, was a pair of juice soaked lips mouthing higher, higher. This was before my skin became a consolation prize. Now I offer myself in parts, give just enough away to make them feel like a winner. I play games with my reflection to see how many pieces I can break into. One piece, a pointed elbow, another, a broken rib. This body is seeking freedom, is a hollow throat unable to scream, a pair of hands still reaching for the sun. Mm. Such a powerful poem. And uh, it, it sort of combines all of these personal experiences. So uh, my question is around when you, and I, my second book has a lot of memoir poems that draw from my personal experience. How do you sort of determine that line to draw between personal experiences that that are poetic and personal experiences that just don't work in poetry um, or can't be made to work? How did you kind of sort through that as you were writing this poem? Yeah, I knew I wanted, like with this poem, I wanted to write it specifically using 
you know, my, my experience from childhood. Um, I wanted to make sure that with every line I was including um, a, a piece of a memory. Um, so I wanted it to be as realistic as possible while still obviously, you know, um, sprinkling in some, some symbolism and things like that. Um, the, the poem was, um, it was really about my, my childhood and, and the transition between eight years old and nine years old when, um, uh, you know, at nine years old, my, my life transitioned, um, you know, the goal of my ballet training at that time changed from, you know, having fun and making friends to the, uh, the pursuit of an eventual professional career in classical ballet. And so I really wanted to infuse as much, um, you know, as many memories as possible, um, from that transitional year, um, and make it just as realistic as possible. Marvelous. So actually the, the symbols that come up in this poem, do you gather them over time? Do you, and, and find a place for them in the poem or are you in the realm of the poem and then search for these symbols that you include? Uh, no, I was actually, I was, and that's a great question. I was in the realm of the poem when, when the symbolism really formed. Um, you know, at first when I was writing this poem, it's it's more of a memoir poem. And so at first when I was writing it, it was actually um, more literal than this. And then as I was writing it, I was thinking more about, you know, that transitional year from, you know, looking at the innocence of childhood into looking at what, you know, one year of fear, aggression, and shame can have on that childhood innocence. So I really wanted to draw on that and, and provide symbolism that spoke to that, which is where the last line of the poem came from with a pair of hands still reaching for the sun. Um, so it was very much, um, uh, the process itself was while I was writing the poem, the symbolism wasn't planned at all. Mm. Beautiful. And what have you learned from uh, readers of your poetry who have had similar experiences? I've learned a, a great deal. One of the things I've learned is that um, transition isn't transition isn't linear. Um, you know, we all have transitional periods in our lives, and you know, when I look back on my life and I look at at my poetry, it looks like it's so linear. Like you know, A B C happened, um, but really, you know, when you when you unwrap a poem, um, it, it shows a much more a much more challenging pathway, um, you know, transitioning from childhood to adolescence or adolescence to to adulthood. It's there. It's no one size fits all. And a lot of feedback that I've gotten from my poems, because I, I talk a lot about the different transitions in my life. A lot of the feedback I've gotten um, has been, you know, the, people appreciate the fact that I'm that I'm so open with my own struggles and with my own challenges mm -hmm. um, because it allows them to feel heard, to feel represented and, and know that, you know, life in any aspect is not linear. So that's definitely one thing I've learned. Wonderful. All right, Rachel. So now we'll hand the mic over to you for your first poem. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Jessica is beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So the first poem is I go wandering inside my head and the title moves into the first line as a first line. I go wandering inside my head alone. At the gate of my head, a bull the color of hot tar on yellowing paper. He ignores me, chews the perpetual grass. Beyond the gate is escape like the moon. It is not a known moon, nor of poetry. It is a red moon and subtle, and I walk backwards to see where I have been. The gravity here is the weight of an apple on the highest branch. When I try to catch the apple as it falls, I am inadequate as a pebble-hued moth. Slim as a coin, the moth makes holes so great, whole empires fall through them over and over. Let me return to the civilization whose god is a sunfish, flat as a palm. There my hands are nonsense. I just wave them around, astonished by their disobedience. They draw only the bull, its face the face of a heart that has seen itself and walked through its halls all the same. Oh, wonderful. So surreal and beautiful. And how do you approach these images that are so surreal and yet you create a poem that that um, has, has a, such a personal element too? Like, how do you find that balance? 
<sighs> That's a wonderful question. I think actually it's it's interesting to see that these first three poems, we didn't plan this. I think they all have right. ecrastic, ecrastic <laughs> elements to it, right? We've got dance and sculpture, and this is um, was inspired by painting. I think I went to um, a, a Picasso exhibit and you see his juvenilia and you see you know his sketches, these just tossed off sketches from when he was like 12. You're like, okay. So, you know, everyone I think starts starts there. So it really, I think it feels very much like this is an 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 um, an entry into writing poetry and starting to figure out what the landscape is like. And when you're wandering inside your head, there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on in there. So I think that it's it's really um, making strange many of the things that you one comes across, you know, in one's daily life. It's um, life is extremely odd uh, when you sort of step back a little bit and be like, even the dishwasher, you're like, there's a box that cleans dishes. I don't know. See, th these things seem surreal to me. So um, it definitely feels that like most things in life have a very surreal element. And I and poetry is the place I get to really play within that landscape. So I've got the um, the the sketching artistic kind of feel to it. And then the the strangeness that that evokes sort of, um, bring, you know, brings an atmosphere of that to the rest of life. Rachel, that poem is so impactful. I, I remember when I, I first read it, I was just like my jaw was open. It was beautiful. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, what was the most challenging part um, for you um, in writing this poem? What did you find most difficult? getting into and then getting out of it. <laughs> like, I think that the getting into it, you're just like, okay, here we go. You know, got to uh, you know, overcome the, the, the quotidian inertia. I think that we all operate generally within during the day. And then you're like, all right, how do I, how do I step through this gateway into another mental realm? Um, and it takes, a, it takes a little while. It takes energy. And then because I've expended this energy throughout the poem, by the time I get out of it, I'm like, I need to go lie down. So it's it's definitely a, a moment of like, am I going to escape? You know, am I stuck in here forever? And, you know, who's going to rescue me? And then when you do get out of it, um, that that kind of hungover feeling <laughs> a little bit to be like, you know, that that takes some recovery too. So it's, I mean, listen, of, of all the things one has to go through in life, this is not a, a big deal. But um, in the moment, it takes, it does take energy. So I think that it's, those are the most difficult moments. The middle, you're just kind of like, want you know, wandering around, and and that's the that's the fun part. <laughs> but the entry and exit are tricky. <laughs> Thanks for that. No, I'm on that. That's great. On the on the exit you're talking about, how do you approach? Um, and I suspect we'll each ask each other this question as we go through this. How do you approach that editing exercise, revision exercise uh, in something in 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 content that is so surreal? Even though it had some, you know, foundation based on a on an image you saw, like how do you approach that editing and revision process? Oh gosh, I want to know this answer for the both of you. So, they start <laughs> thinking about your answer for that. Um, it's 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 difficult. It's kind of going back to a place, you know, re-entering a landscape, and it's familiar, but it it's also made strange again because you're not in the same you're not the same person, I suppose, like going back months later or even days later, you're, you're not the same person. So um, bringing either the, the more, the editor self to it and saying, does is this word working in a way that I want it to be? Is it precise enough? Is it evocative enough? Um, and sometimes it can feel like violence to the poem. It's necessary. It's ne it's necessary to do that sort of thing. But in the moment you're like, but you know, let me, let me hope that I'm making it better and not just you know, making it making it worse in some way. So it's that is uh, my least favorite part. <laughs> but I but I but I do it because it's necessary. I mean, these are these are not fully formed, you know, creatures from Zeus's thigh. I mean, they, these definitely need a lot of shepherding into into doneness. <laughs> I think that's exactly right. Like necessary violence. I never thought about it that mm -hmm. way, but it's really accurate. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to tuck that phrase away as the uh, the editing process is necessary violence to the, to the poem, especially when you you'll discard of something that you're so attached to. But then usually I find when I discard those things, literally minutes later, I'll I won't even remember what I just cut. 
and then that's the test that it really wasn't so important after all. Mm, that's good. That's good. Yes. If you still remember it a week later, maybe change it back. <laughs> but yes, you exactly. made the right choice. Yes. But usually, usually I just, I don't remember anymore. All <laughs> right. I'm going to go on to round two. All right. This is also from my first book, uh, Canvas. I'm sure you'll have questions about this, I'll, I'll, which I'll explain afterwards. The green line. Now, the green line trolley rumbles past Park Street, Boylston, Arlington, Copley, Heinz Convention Center, Kenmore, Fenway, Longwood, Brooklyn Village, Brooklyn Hills, Beaconsfield Reservoir, Chestnut Hill. Each stop blurring one into another. A Boston policeman sitting silent next to me, stiff cap, pointed badge, crisp jacket, black boots, eyes forward. My parents anxiously awaiting outside Newton Center Station. I am 11. 45 minutes ago. I do what I always do, locked in routine. Go down into the station, put the fare in the fare box, spin through the turnstile, turn right, stairs down, the tunnel beneath the tracks connecting east to west and home. The station, quiet and empty, I turn to take the first step down. They surround me from the tunnel's shadows, 10 boys, maybe 12, buzzing with excitement. One pushes me and another, and then a hand clamps over my mouth. In that moment, a memory burns, fingers rough on my lips, sticky smell, a sweaty palm, a burst of terror, unable to breathe. They pull me wrestling down the stairs, smothered mouth screams, tears, panic, and then, in a moment, a shout from across the tracks. They scatter into the shadows. The policeman must have appeared, or perhaps a ticket seller or passerby. I remember nothing and will never know. Seconds, minutes, hours, my mind erased by each stolen breath and after a time sitting silent on the green line trolley. 50 minutes ago, I do what I always do locked in routine. Go from McDonald's to the Park Street station. Don't cross the street, go into the station. Go down the stairs, into the tunnel and under the tracks. That's how you go home. My heart is still racing when they appear, 10 boys, maybe 12, laughing, surrounding me, blocking the station entrance. Where are you going? Leave me alone, my shy voice trembling. Again, they disappear, so I step down. 60 minutes ago. I do what I always do, locked in routine. After choir practice, grab dinner next door at McDonald's. 20 should be plenty. Remember to bring home change. When turning from the counter, my tray full of dinner, two boys approach. Are you alone? Yes, my shy voice trembles, knowing yes is the wrong answer. And then they are gone, leaving me alone, sweat trickling down my neck. 65 minutes ago. I do what I always do, locked in routine. Grab dinner before coming home. McDonald's is next door. I walk out of the Cathedral Church of St. Paul, steps away from Boston's Freedom Trail, breathing in crisp fall air, choir practice hymns ringing in my ears. I am ready for dinner and the green line home. It was Wednesday. James, the choreography of that poem is just beautiful. Like, just beautiful. Um, I wanted to ask you, with this poem, what message were you trying to convey to your readers? I wanted to make people feel very unsettled, um, kind of the way I felt. And it was extremely difficult to write this memory down, partially because I had to relive it, um, although it was so long ago and I, I, I was able to force you to do that without it being too traumatic because the situation was very traumatic at the time, understandably. Uh, so then it became this real challenge of how do I, I took a, I did it as a prose poem that wasn't quite working. I did it in linear time and that wasn't working. And then it was this, the epiphany there was, oh, if I do it backwards, then it creates this sense of this early sense of dread, and then it sort of unwinds, um, and uh, and that would that really helped. And then it was, 
this tricky act of how much detail do I include? And there's parts that I remember very clearly and there's parts that I don't remember at all. Um, that time gap between where I was let free and how I ended up on the, I don't remember any of that. It's just wiped out. The other parts I remember extremely clearly. I could relive it right now. So yeah, that, that reverse structure really um, helped the poem come together. Yeah, I think it was extremely effective. Mm -hmm. Beautifully Absolutely. written. Absolutely. I mean, going at that, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful question too, because in terms of form, um, those variations on a theme, like it, it becomes um, in, almost incantatory. Like you, you know that you're stuck in this memory spiral. Um, were you influenced by any poets who had used that particular form um, or had maybe now even remembering, like sometimes influences come in subconsciously and you're, you're not, you don't consciously, you know, um, honor them in, in, in a writing, but um, anyone who comes to mind who has used that sort of thing? No, I don't think it's any poetry, but I was definitely influenced by Benjamin Button, that movie, where it, it goes backwards. And I think that probably was what connected the dots. Um, you know, the visualization of the poem, which I'll try to hold up, is is probably one of the styles I like to employ, which is uh, all lowercase, a lot of enjambment line breaks, not a lot of punctuation um, is one of the styles I like to employ. And uh, that was definitely influenced by E.E. E. Cummings very early on, like back in 10th grade when I got into poetry, that was the poet where I went, oh, poems can be something different than this, um, what at the time felt very old style of poetry. There are definitely modern versions of po poetry that follows strict form like A.E. Stallings and it's beautiful. A lot of high school poetry though, you end up getting hit over the head with poetry that's really not modern in any way. And E. Cummings was like, a, that was a light bulb. Oh my goodness, you can write poetry with all the, you can make up the rules. And so, yeah, I did come, I did have a very specific structure and there's a symmetry, but I was able to invent it for the poem. Uh, and it wasn't something that I really, in this particular case, took from somewhere else. Other than the Benjamin Button idea, that was definitely in my head. <laughs> Inspiration could come from anywhere. I, I think that's been totally. <laughs> <Very Definitely. good. laughs> Cool. All right. So let's go with, uh, I think, who's up next? Jessica, your Ooh, second yes. poem. Great. Um, so this poem is uh, currently unpublished. Um, mm. <laughs> it's called 21. This fruit salad is the first thing I've eaten in three days. Somewhere along the way, I forgot how to swallow. There are extra napkins in all my pockets, like I have a compulsion for clean things. I'm a black hole stomach and glass jar heart, and there's never enough that can fill one or the other up, and things seep out as if they were made that way. This day is supposed to be a lot of things, except a reminder of everything I could have been. I chopped off my hair last week, added another piercing inside my mouth, and Dad's right when he says, you've lost too much weight. And I think how easy it will be to climb into the shadows, to stop up all the holes and lose myself in what remains. Hmm. Your poetry is so powerful, and the and the, the and what you've experienced. There are so many people that I know are out there who have had similar experiences and may feel like they're the only one, and and that and they're not. Um, what um, and I also think it's super inspiring to see where you are now. I mean, are, is part of you want to capture where you were and then that where you are now and that that hope that's embedded in that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and that's this poem, while unpublished, it's part of a larger um, full length collection that I'm currently working on. And this poem, I really wanted to show what it was like, you know, being in the depths of my mental illness. Um, you know, I wrote this poem as a, a short memoir more of my 21st birthday um and to someone battling with mental illness in my case anorexia and bulimia you know life um you know for me birthdays were were mile markers for survival uh where i reflected on all the moments that had nearly you know taken my life since the last birthday that had been had that had been celebrated um and so you know this poem while it while it shows um you know a lot of what was going on in the depths of my mental illness um there are parts of it where i wanted to show that that there is self-reflection even in the even in the darkest parts of the human experience 
Um, so that's what I was trying to convey, you know, with this poem to show that, um, you know, there really is, there really is hope. I'd love to know what the influence, the poetic or artistic or um, other influences are for the style and the sort of confessional style or narrative style. Anyone who has really brought that out in you, because this this feels um, of of a tradition in in poetics. Um, anyone who really has been a touchstone. Yeah, there's one person in particular um, who's really encouraged me to find my not only my voice but my authentic voice um and that's my wife shannon um you know i i've been a writer for a long time um and when i met her 14 years ago um i was in just a really dark place in my life um you know with my mental illness and um you know she really challenged me to find the value in myself and to use the the darkest experiences that I've been through um, to to not only help myself, but to help others. So the the most significant person in my life who's really, you know, inspired me to write not only confessionally, but also authentically is her. And then, you know, the, you know, I mentioned that writing the green line for me just definitely required me to get inside a memory that was very traumatic. And similarly for you, many of your poems very effectively take someone like myself that has not had that experience directly and gives me a new empathy and understanding at a deeper level than if I had read a piece of prose describing. Uh, so what what's what is it like for you digging into those? Is it therapeutic? Is it triggering and traumatic in a way, or is it a kind of a combination of both? It's a combination of both. Um, you know, when I when I wrote this poem, I had a very different idea of what this poem was going to look like um, because the the memory of my twenty first birthday is just just ingrained in my mind uh, for, for multiple reasons. Um, so writing it was both, it was both triggering, but it was also um, really empowering because again, I was taking this really dark memory where, um, you know, what should have been a day flagged with, with joy and hope for the future was instead weighted by my illness. Um, you know, and I remember being present for others that day who celebrated my life and, and accomplishments, but I wasn't present myself, which was a common theme in my life. And so I found that by writing, by writing with the purpose of communicating that common theme, I not only was able to address um, those memories, um, but also like come out of it feeling stronger. So it was both triggering and empowering. That's a great question. Cool. All right, Rachel, your second poem. Okay, thank you. This is called, Each Meal Here Was Once Alive. I hold my head on its column of clay, beads still as a ruined field. I trick the dumb dove down from the branch she stresses, even in her hollowness. In this garden, ants the size of dinner plates from a distance. Each meal here was once alive, you say, and press your ear to the tomato vine to count its rounded heartbeats. I envy the penmanship of sweet peas, the vigilance of rosemary, cabbage leaves marked like astral math maps by moths. Figs swell and split, a cicada shedding its skeleton. When you hold one out to me, I drive my thumb into its seated throat. Now my first question is more of a visual one. Um, I think the layout of this program, which of course I'll hold it up. I've got a printout of it, so I do have your book too. But there you go. There's, uh, you know, it's sort of this, this stagger step phrases and words and time and and how do you approach that visualization of your poem? Mm. Form has always actually been difficult, um, and so this using the page in a particular way is a conscious choice. I think so. Writing it maybe out, not quite in prose, but in in more of a you know traditional tight column and then letting it breathe a little bit and seeing where it mm. wants to land on the page. Um, that's I think how I get into a little bit of this um, movement. And then what I think I enjoyed was sort of watching how, how it mimics the, the 
observation process. So, you know, you see one thing and maybe you focus on it for a moment or two, and then there's sort of a skip. And maybe in, in that skip is another memory that comes in or something that like that, that sort of um, non-linearity of observation. Um, I think that, that there's something in here of that in those white spaces and uh, moments of, of incremental change in nature that happens within those little moments that either we notice or miss, <laughs> you know, sort of de depends on, on where you are in, in that moment. So um, that's a great question, but form, form has always been uh, ha having, I need to consciously approach it. <laughs> so I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I love this poem, Rachel. The ending is, is so powerful. Um, what, what inspired you to, to write this poem? I'm interested. I think it was really um, that that mm, looking at nature, which can be beautiful when you first look at it. You're like, oh, look at these beautiful flowers, and and this is blooming, and these these fruits are are burgeoning, you know, whatever. And then you look a little closer, and you're like, ooh, this is just like horrific. <laughs> like there's a, <laughs> there's a lot going on that's that can be very frightening and and a lot about decay and a lot about um, things eating each other. So it's wonderfully um, double, right, in its, its moment um, of, of observation. You are seeing incredible beauty. And then the, what makes it even more beautiful is that horror behind it, I think. And, and that the fact that we participate in that horror, for sure, um, as parts of nature and as inflicting our will upon nature and, and having nature inflict its will upon us. So um, I think that that moment of, of duality of beauty and uh, danger and terror and ugliness is, is very interesting to me. Yeah, you have a yeah. macabre element to your poetry, but it's not uh, dark and depressing, but there's definitely, what, what is it, what, do you have a, what sort of triggered that fascination for you to see things in that way? Ooh, great question. Um, I think in, in this is to be quite personal, but like I've worked so hard in my life to make things, um, you know, good and and easy and beautiful um, because I think we all, you know, human beings want to move toward pleasure, you know, as opposed to pain. And and yet there's always that pain, no matter, you know, you think you found um, certainty and control and pleasure and um, it's an illusion. So I think that always being aware of that, even in moments of great joy, and they can be quite pure. And yet the the purity is is there's a tiny tiny little bit that actually you know of of knowing that this is only momentary. This is only temporary. Um, it makes it more joyful. So you know there's there's definitely I love I love the the darkness. I love those images and uh, just just how how they shadow. A lot of life makes it more interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for these questions. These are fantastic. Really, uh, gotta think on the fly. I love it. <laughs> I'm, liking this, I'm liking this format, which uh, I'm definitely gonna gonna use this again. All right. So now, I think we're up to me again. So I'm gonna read a poem from my new book, Portraits of Red and Gray, which is uh, largely about a trip I took to the Soviet Union in 1983. Uh, but this. Uh, this poem is from a different place. Normandy in nine scenes. One, business trip detour. I head out alone when meetings end on the TGV speeding west from Latour Eiffel to Normandy's coast. Scenes fly by, flutter by in a blur. Two, disembark for Chocolat. My rollerboard rattles to a quaint hotel in Caen. Moulot au chocolat awaits, and with a nudge, the center flows, molten on my plate. Three, up at dawn. The directions are unfolded in near English and French. Arrive precisely at nine, the Memorial de Caen. Steady rain, shivers. The streets are mostly empty. The Citroën departs. Four, none but one. The meeting place is empty, perhaps I botched the time, but sure enough, and on the dot, the tour guide arrives. I'm 40 something, six foot five, the guide petite and half my age. An awkward pause as she looks up, 
A French knot scarf is tied just so. Her voice is firm, Parisian tones. Do you mind the rain? I think she hopes I'll quit the tour, but I am not deterred. Resigned, she turns, clipboard in hand, and leads me to her van. Five, they head west. I sit up front by textbook stacks, empty rows behind. Driving west past Bayeux, picturesque and calm, the guide speaks softly and begins. That town was spared during the war, this other one fully destroyed. Six, the white crosses. I wander through the countless rows, white crosses set in green, below Cimetière Americain, the channel within reach, saving Private Ryan scenes. But the beaches now are hedgehog free, two lovers walking hand in hand, a fisherman by lines of rods anchored in gray sand. Later, my guide whispers, this is my favorite place, melancholy, a quiet space. Seven, we're ranger scaled. Where we go next is up to you, so I ask her to suggest. In that case, off to Pointe de Hoc, not sure what to expect. She tells me tales of army rangers scaling cliffs, then trapped for days. German soldiers tucked in bunkers. We climb down into burrowed craters blasted long ago. Since the war, she observes, nothing here will ever grow. Eight, the black crosses. She starts to drive back, back towards Caen, the rain slowing to mist. There's one more place I recommend. It's not part of the tour. I signal yes. We park near some hedges, unkempt and nondescript. This graveyard's, graveyard's for forgotten soldiers, not marked on any map. Each plot holds Germans two or three buried in a stack. I pause among the unnamed crosses, each simply carved in black. Nine, white and black. Now it's time, she checks her watch as we turn to leave. Through the windshield, fields pass by, each filled with crosses, black and white, their arms outstretched and drenched in mist, each waiting for the clouds to lift. James, that's my favorite poem of your of your collection. Mm. It's just beautifully written. Um, I, I had a question for you. So, in the as someone who's reading this poem, in the beginning, um, you know, you're set off on this adventure, and it's, um, you know, it reads like very lighthearted in the beginning, um, and then obviously towards the end, it becomes um, much heavier. So, how did you how did you approach um, this this dual subject matter? Um, and how did you bring it into one like cohesive um, narrative? This is one of those poems that was rewritten and dis and set aside for months and rewritten again and set aside for months so many times. I was determined to get this experience down on paper because it really was a remarkable experience. I had this I went for this tour. I took a, I took an extra day, took a business trip, extended it by a day, and was really wanted to visit Normandy and booked this three, four hour tour and was supposed to be with 10, 12 people, but still pretty intimate. And then I'm the only one who showed up because the weather was kind of crummy. And I just remember the this petite, you know, probably 20 something college student looking, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be in a van <laughs> with this really tall American for three hours. And she was just hoping I would bail out, which I didn't. And then it turned out she was this expert. So I wanted to um, kind of set up just this almost travelogue type of experience. But then uh, as I went through it, this very powerful stop in this unkempt German cemetery, that, that the contrast between the black crosses stacked in three white crosses, like that became the anchor. Uh, but I got there through going through so many revisions. The first, you'll still hear some of the rhymes in it. The first version of it was very strict form rhymes, and it just took the punch out of it. And then I had another poem written in a screenplay format, which is the way, I should hold that up, the way this is 
formatted. It's kind of meant to look like a screenplay. And my younger daughter said, your screenplay format's not working in that poem, use it in something else. And that was like, ooh, boom, it's like a little screenplay. And, uh, and then it kind of came together. So it was a very hard to get that balance right. And I, I wanted to really lengthen the front part where it's lighter to really have the, the ending white black crosses. And then the last image, which what a reader put in my mind, which I didn't even notice is um, the, when you, of course, the, the crosses are where people were buried, but it's not where they were killed. So if you, it, I had this image of, uh, well, what if the crosses were where people were actually killed? They would be everywhere, you know, across Normandy. And uh, that really kind of stuck with me. I didn't notice that when I was writing it. I must have, maybe I thought of it subconsciously, but yeah, that's right. They, they, the, the crosses would have been everywhere. Yeah, so I'm so glad you're touched by this poem. It was a very hard one to get right. I love that you say that it's actually a screenplay because the films and television, they're, they're, visual and they are very location based right like like location uh, specific and location plays such a huge role in your poetry i think across the board i mean it's you you locate the reader in a particular place with particular characteristics and and there there is a universality to it but also obviously it's a very individual experience of that place um how how do you approach place when you are writing a poem when you're wandering around in in that place in your memory um what tends to stand out what tends to do you notice anything that gets left out i mean how what's the relationship to a specific location for you uh, that's a great question certainly you know there's a risk with poetry that's tied to something so concrete that you end up over describing and putting in too much detail and so uh i'm sure i've one nice thing is i write all my poems in google box i can look through the revision history and see all the stuff i chopped out and in this one, there was definitely more detail. And I just had to really look at it and sound it off of other sounding board off of colleagues to see what is that amount of detail that is just enough to be necessary, but leaves enough for the imagination. You know, the, the, uh, the Rangers one, the Rangers part, I rewrote so many times because there's so much detail you could include there. But the thing I really wanted was walked into the craters, nothing there will ever grow. I remember her saying that, and it was just desolate. And she said, nothing will grow here for some almost like karma reason. Um, so I really wanted that to remember, but I needed to write enough context. So it's really tricky. Um, I think I want to have enough context so people aren't confused, but just enough and not an ounce more. Wonderful. Yeah, you sort of open it up to, to visitation, both in the poem and then possibly in real life, right? If somebody has this, your poem in their mind and they go to Normandy, they that echo is always going to be there. So it's it's a wonderful angle, you know, in, into or onto the one's individual experience of it later. And if you go again, you'll have your those memories also, right? Of your own poem and the sort of the, the translation of experience and memory into art. I mean, I just think that's a wonderful process that's never ending. So that's just beautiful. No, well, now that I'm writing a lot more poetry, I'm definitely being very, I, I'm a, when I go to a museum, when I go to a place, I'm definitely activated to look for those starting points. And uh, it's so convenient having, you know, having your phone and just tap a few ideas, which I'm sure both of you do, where you'll, I'll, I'll tell my wife, hold on a second. Uh, and then she'll <laughs> know I'm jotting down a phrase or an image, just enough to give me an inkling of what, that there might be something there. Yeah. Definitely. Beautiful. So now we're on our third round and uh, Jessica, you are up. Sounds great. Uh, so this poem is from my chapbook. It's entitled Requital. As a girl, forgiveness came easy, came through bended knee and confession screens, came through murmured Hail Marys until my lips became chapped from convincing myself a clean room meant I was too. Later, forgiveness came with force formed from blood and flesh, my flesh, formed from red-rimmed sink drains, and my face hollowed from alcohol and the dark run home. On summer mornings, it was gentle. Storm clouds and rain-pelted lawns softened from the blows of fat drops, or canvas shoes drying on the floor grate while the coffee machine whirred in the kitchen, its hum deep, matching my skin folded into a paper, grain, paper crane burrowed among the bedsheets. In winter, it was a blizzard with thick clouds of ice, 
coating fields of cotton, the snow tickling my nose as I leaned into the wind. Now it is my naked body in front of a mirror, a roadmap of razor scars and stretch marks, faded tattoos, piercings that refuse to close. It is here I am learning how to say mine without stutter, refusing to apologize for taking up too much sidewalk, learning to fill the space reserved for all my apologies. The images that you create are so powerful. I'm curious where your poems start and uh, do they start with a powerful image and then that's sort of the anchor and you go from there or does it start with a like a thread you want to traverse or does it I'm sure it depends is the real answer but you know maybe for this poem specifically is you know did you have a couple of images that really you knew oh there's something there and I should build on those. Yeah, for this poem, um, I mean, certain poems, I, I start with an image, others I start with a purpose. Um, for this poem, I definitely started with a purpose. I wanted to illustrate the war between self-love and guilt uh, while navigating recovery from an eating disorder. Um, this poem is specifically um, written from when I was, um, you know, first learning recovery. Um, I, I wanted to convey in this poem what forgiveness looked like in both suffering and in recovery and how while there's a, a juxtaposition of those apologies, they converge into one central truth. Um, and that was that I am, that I was and I am enough in all forms. So that was, mm -hmm. I, I really started this poem with with that purpose in mind. Um, but that that's a great question. Thanks, James. <laughs> So when when these poems are about the body in in trauma and over time and in recovery and in continuing to have those scars, when you write a poem and then when you revisit a poem, where do you feel that in your body? Like, is it is it a very is it a bodily experience or is it an out of body experience or is it a, a, a flickering in between? Like, where where is that located? I would say it's. A I would say it's a definite, it's definitely a flickering in between. That's a good way to put it, Rachel. Um, you know, when I'm writing these poems, it's very, when I'm in the middle of writing a poem like this, it's, it's visceral. Um, you know, I, I feel it, I feel it everywhere. I feel it in, in the, the strain of my hands. I feel it in the, the tension of my neck, um, in the clouding of my thoughts. <laughs> but um, there is also a component where, you know, I'm not just feeling it in my body, but I'm also, you know, I feel the heaviness of it emotionally and psychologically, but at the same time, again, there's also a lightness when I'm writing a poem like this, because while I'm talking about something, you know, the, the subject matter is so heavy and, you know, at times it's really dark, but again, I try to write also with um, a sense of hope and a, and a, a sense of purpose. Um, you know, that's something I, I really strive for in my writing because I don't just want to talk about the, the difficult times that I've experienced. I want to talk about, you know, the, the good things that are to come when, when someone really places their own value above, above everything else. Um, you know, for, for me in my past, I, I never placed much value in myself when I was in the depths of my eating disorder. And, you know, it was only really through learning the value of myself that I was able to, you know, pursue living. Um, so yeah, I would say it's definitely in between. Um, I feel it physically when I write or even when I go back years later and I read the poem, but it, I also feel it emotionally and psychologically. So Thanks in terms of, yeah, in terms of uh, influences that have helped you approach the type of poetry you write that where there's effective balance between the poetry and these very strong personal experiences are there some poets that you found particularly inspiring that you you know actually maybe billy collins said you should read poems poets that make you jealous and that you you wish you could write as well as them and you don't want to copy them but they, they, you know they're poets that challenge you to go more there's <clears throat> there's some poets that have helped you achieve what you've been able to achieve um Yes, there's one poet in particular. Um, you know, I, I didn't start writing poetry um, until I was, um, you know, in my early 30s. And um, one poet in particular really spoke to me. Uh, her name is Janan uh, Verley. And her, her writing is, uh, the only really way I can describe it, it it's visceral. It, you know, I remember uh, watching her recite her poems um, and videos, and I, I had purchased her books, and 
her work just left me stunned. Um, and I, I was really uh, inspired by that because I wanted, I wanted to write that way. I didn't just want to write about my own experiences, um, like in a memoir fashion. I wanted to write work that provided detail, but also kept enough of it out to where it, it really impacted the reader to think. Um, and so she was, she was probably the most significant, um, the, the most significant poet um, from from not only my my early adulthood, but even now, um, you know, her her work is just stunning. Amazing. All right, Rachel, I think you are you are our last poem for the day. This has been so much fun. So I'm excited for you to close out this uh, this Beulah Swings live event that we'll do more of using this format. I think it's pretty cool. It's been a good uh, beta test of this format. So uh, please share your third poem. Wonderful. It's a nice little short one. Um, another after after another piece of visual art. So there's a, there seems to be a theme here that I'm discovering <laughs> after the fact. It's called the Puzzle Monster, and it's um, about a Francis Bacon painting, Three Studies of Lucian Freud, 1969. Thousands of eyes are roaming around. The cage demarcates only the cage. Unhappy ape praying for everything. Museum ache zinging his whole spine. Such velvets and golds for living through the worst. There is nothing else, says the ape. Eat. Flowers bloom on his skin. We scoop up the deep reds and purples of the insides of meat, of fruit. Blessed be the monster who made you, who makes you still. Now, I have a question about writing poems that are shorter. Um, yeah. And how you uh, was this a poem that's that you knew was kind of going to be short, or did it end up the the length it is because that was the right length after cutting out a bunch of things? Like just I've found poems that were, that I've written that are really short that didn't start that way, but as I cut cut cut, they just got to the length they needed. So curious how you approach a shorter poem. Gosh, I wish I could write longer poems. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. I envy both of you. I'm like I would love to make it to the second page. I'm going to tell you that much right now. It's, it it really is about that like. Being, that stamina, sort of that that energy that needs to be sustained um, throughout, and and um, not wanting to rush out. And I think that that this one, this one in particular, it was because there there's a the the, the painting itself has sort of parameters, like physical parameters. It's, it it lives within a canvas, um, and so there's a possibility that there was uh, not, not wanting to wander too far outside of those borders. And I think at a, at a certain time, I think it, lengthening poems is really actually my challenge <laughs> rather than, than writing a whole lot and then pairing back. Um, I'd love to challenge myself in the next, you know, several months to a year to really just be like, just keep going. You know, it might be terrible and you might hate where, where you're being led, but um, just get to the second page. <laughs> so I think that that's, that's the challenge. Oh, actually, I work with a poetry coach. It's a real, I've interviewed him for the podcast. Uh, he's terrific. And he actually, because I, I can definitely write longer poems. And he's, he challenged me, he said, all right, the exercise for next week is I want you to write micro poems. That, and he gave me a, a maximum <laughs> number of words. And uh, it was a pretty small number. And it was, uh, it was challenging. So I think that's, that's, I'm the challenge in the opposite direction. And actually, when I saw Billy Collins recently, his next book coming out in the fall is all extremely short poems. I think they're two or three lines, which is definitely different than what he normally writes. And he read a couple of them. And I'm like, wow, that's incredible how much you packed into such a tiny amount of space. So yeah, I definitely think uh, um, I, I'm very challenged by really high quality short poems like the one you you read that has so much packed in that it's it's dense without being dense it's light but at the same time dense there's a lot there um yeah so jessica i'll let you ask the last question sure um rachel the the ending of this poem is so powerful um blessed be the monster who made you who makes you still that's incredible um what was what was the um, most challenging part of writing this poem since it is so short? Mm -hmm. I think taking on such a monumental artist. I mean, what, what are you going to say about someone who has made an absolute masterpiece and you're like, oh, you, you're in the pantheon. Like I'm just a little tiny, you know, peon back here being like, well, you're amazing. So it, it definitely is that um, relationship, I think, to the subject and the, and the context and the, 
um, addressing another just far superior creator and and navigating I think that's that space in between um, is is really tricky. It's sort of a little bit of an imposter syndrome if you want to call it that or um, you know anxiety of influence, all these sorts of things start to come in but um, yeah, once again, like once you're out of it, you're like, okay, like I can, you, you, I can now put you back in, in the, you know, the firmament. I can now back away. <laughs> so I think that's probably it. So to close off, I want to thank both of you for participating and being guinea pigs on this format, which I think is really good. So let's do our last round robin is if you've got them to hold up, we both, we all have books. There are my two books, Canvas and Portraits of Red and Gray. And there are uh, the wonderful books that I have read both of them because I've interviewed both the poets. When I interview someone, I read the books multiple times. Um, yes, yes. incredible. Yes. yes, and a lot of interviewers don't uh, or they shortcut. So no, I wouldn't do it that way. So they're wonderful books. I strongly encourage everyone to, to check them out. And subscribe to the YouTube channel, Mandatory Plug, just to be notified of future events. Jessica, Rachel, thank you so much for uh, giving an hour of your time and poetry today. Thank, oh, you. thank you. This was wonderful. <laughs>